great. You're happy to be in the house of God this morning. Praise Amen. God. Well, hey, we're, we're going to make our confession real quick. So if I stand up, you can grab your Bible, grab a phone, steal a Bible, do something, share a Bible or whatever. That's all good. We even have a Bible up here. That's great. But we're going to make our confession because we believe this is the word of God. So lift it up and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. This morning I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I have the grace of God to do the will of God. I have the grace of God to do the word of God. And I will do it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Give the Lord a hand clap one more time. Praise God. How many of y'all are excited to be in God's house this morning? Isn't it awesome? Man, turn to neighbor and say, I'm so glad I'm sitting next to you. Oh my goodness. Come on, turn to your other neighbor and say, man, you sure smell good. What is that? A new cologne? What's that? What's that? Say, did you put two different colognes on y'all? Hey, y'all, hey, man, boy, y'all be like, put like two or three colognes on. Let it fight it out. People walk by and like, oh, falling out in the Holy Ghost. But anyway. Y'all, listen, I want to remind y'all, why are we here? Our existence, we're here for three things, man. To love God, love people, and to leave His mark. And we're going to do, I'm telling you, man, till the day I die, I'm going to be telling I'm going to be telling people about Jesus. I'm going to be praying for people. Till the day we go to heaven, or whether I die first or Jesus comes back, I'm going to live for Him because we, we have a revelation that God is God, right? It's either He's God or He's not. Well, yes, guess what, man? I believe with all of my heart and I know that he is God. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. Well, we've been talking about the, uh, the last, what, three weeks about limitless. Last couple of weeks we've been talking about, man, that God has a limitless anointing that he wants to put on us. We found out as humans, we're very limited. Turn to your, your husband or wife. Don't say anything. Just kind of look at him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> We are limited, okay? We have limited personality. We have limited finances. We have limited, um, you know, gifts and limited, our, our knowledge may be limited. But guess what? The limitless one is at work inside of us. Somebody say amen. amen. How many of y'all know that God has no limits? He loves us and his power is, he's all powerful. He's everywhere. He has greatness and power we don't even with our mind we cannot comprehend how powerful and how great he is we just accept it by faith anybody ever tried to try to think well you know well god didn't have a beginning you know and he wasn't ever created so how did that work and we kind of just get lost in a snowball of because our mind doesn't comprehend that we live in this thing called time Right. And we all get, you know, between 60, 70, 80 years, 120. Believe God for 120. We, we, we're all living in this. And so we think, you know, that's just the way things are. But God doesn't even live in time. Like literally, he's never had a start. He's the Alpha and Omega. It's like literally he's the beginning and then he he lived. He does. He's not. He never had a beginning. Anybody ever tried to go down that rabbit hole like um you know, you just kind of fall. You're like, oh, my goodness, I just can't comprehend. That's all right. We don't have to understand God. It's called faith. Well, listen, that God that spoke just a couple words and said, let there be light. That's a, good, that's a few words. That's more than a couple, all right? I'm a mathematician. Let there be light. And there was light. He just spoke it, limitless. And literally, his words are still going. There's still stars being created. There's still light being spoken into the expanse of space. Way, however many, I don't know if it was millions, billions, trip, whatever. It, you know, we know we have the, the mapped out since, uh, the time mapped out since Adam, but we don't know the, you know, how old everything else was because in the beginning was the heavens and the earth. And, you know, he could have created those, I don't know how many billions of years ago. I don't know that. But I'll tell you one thing I do know is that when he said, let there be light, there is still light going from that one word. That's how powerful. He is, and He is inside of us. Amen. And so I just want to say our master text, we've been saying this for four weeks or three weeks, Ephesians 2.20. And if you have a Bible, you can go to it. But if not, a lot of y'all have it memorized, we'll put it up there. Ephesians 3.20. I'm going to read it out of here. I, I feel like reading it. Uh, actually, who is it? I'm sorry. 
Ephesians 3.20, I'm in 2.20. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that is able, let's just pause there, let's just stop right there. Now unto him that is able. How many of y'all have ever said to God, man, I'm not able. I'm not able, I'm not good, I don't, I don't have this or that. Listen, that is true. That is probably a fact. Sometimes it's not, and we just say that we really can. But there are certain things that we just, we cannot do. But guess what? God is able. It says in Ephesians uh, 3.20. Now unto him, talking about God, that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh where? In us. In us. So, so it's not just some big pie in the sky somewhere that God said, let there be light. And sometimes we can pray to him. He might hear us. But, you know, he's just out there somewhere. No, that scripture says that that power that is exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think, that is in us. Somebody say, in us. I want us to get this, man, because the devil said, oh, yeah, there's a God. And that's cool. You can believe that there's a God. But he just wants you to, to keep you from believing and knowing that that God is at work inside of you. Because God spoke these words. He said he wants to you for you to be the hands and feet of Christ, the body of Christ. So when we understand that God is literally using us to be his hands, then the devil starts to shake because he knows, oh my goodness, they cracked the code. Right. They cracked the code because now they know that God can do three things and wants to do things through yes. them. Because as long as we like, oh, we got God's way up there in the sky and he's a great God and all that. You know what the Bible says? You know what Jesus said? You know what it says in the Bible? It says the demons believe that. And they tremble. You ever seen somebody in worship, man? They work with God and tremble, you know, cry and everything. Go out and then they just live like there's not even a God. He's not even real. Like they're not even on the side of God. And there's no not condemnation. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. We've all been there. Everybody's done it. I've done it. Everybody's walked out those doors and acted like a knucklehead. But I want to say this, man. The devils do that. They go into the presence of God. They don't have a choice. Demons, they fall down. What did the demoniac do in the Bible? They came to Jesus and says they worshiped him. They didn't have a choice because God is all powerful. And they fell down at Jesus' feet and said, what do we have to do? What are you doing? Do you want to, you know, what are you doing? And so the demons do that. But what sets us apart is that we have made Jesus our Lord and Savior. And by doing that, we become his hands. We become his feet. We become his mouthpiece. And his literally... Um, we become his outstretched heart to this world. And that is what Satan and, his, and that is what all of the enemy's kingdom is afraid of. Is when we get that revelation that God's power is in us Amen. to work through us. Yes. Man, and that's what we are here at Faith City. We believe that. You know, there's so many times that we pray, God, do this. God, do that. God, help us here. And we're wanting God to do something, but man, we're going to teach, we're going to, we're going to find out this morning. Now listen, God is at work, we're in us. Praise God. Somebody say amen. amen. So y'all, you know, if you are taking notes, I'm going to give y'all some points here, but if not, that's all good, man. You can do that or get through it. I think it's on Facebook or YouTube and all that great stuff. Pastor Lisa will talk about that too, but... The title of my sermon this morning, y'all got to pray for me because I'm not an English major, okay? Y'all need to really help me. My mom is not, she's back there, Memo is, so that's good. But the title of my message is Raise the Roof, okay? But before you spell it, not R-A-I-S-E, like raise the roof higher, but R-A-Z-E, like erase and raise the roof off of your life, Okay? R-A-Z-E. Now, that's a term. A lot of times you say, raise the roof. Let's get loud. Woo -woo. Come on, everybody. All my young people say, woo -woo. raise the roof. M Mr. Mike, he's our young people right there. I like that. My young people, Mr. Mike, run around. Yes, baby, baby, that's me. That's right. To the day I die, I'm going to be a young person. Amen. <laughs> but y'all, listen, sometimes it's our mentality. And that's what the world said. We need to get our standards higher. And we need to raise our, our eyes up a little bit and we need to go higher and that's all good and true but I want to know I want you to understand and I want to understand this one thing that God does not just want us to elevate our goals like man you need to dream a little higher a little bit higher come on just raise that bar a little bit you know you can do a little bit better than that you know those the, it's good to think progressively and forwardly 
But there's still a limitation. If you can, you know, if you can do this much, we like, I want to do, and th their goals are good. And the Bible says people will perish for lack of, of vision and the lack of knowledge. But I want you to understand that God does not want a goal to be a limitation. He wants you to take the roof off, and my goal is to, you know, I want to go this high, and then I want to go this high, but he does not want there to be a roof, because when I get that high, then I will have reached my limit. But you know what? We have limits, but God is limitless. You know, we think, well, I was born on this side of the tracks. Well, I was born over here. I came from this type of family, and, you know, ain't no... no Nobody's ever gone to college. And so, you know, as long as I can raise my mom, you know, graduate high school and get a good job. But, you know, that, that's my roof right there. You know, and that's kind of a, it's just a simple thing. But it, the example, somebody has placed that roof in your life and you're like, well, you know, college, that's my cap. You know, nobody's owned a business that I ain't know anybody that owns a business. So, you know, I, I can go here and I got goals. I just need to be realistic. But no, no, God wants you to take that roof and raise it literally with a razor just whoosh. Take it away. You know, in World War II, um, you hear that phrase a lot. You know, a lot of these buildings would be raised to the ground. You see a lot of times now in, in architectural that they want to build a new building in place of some old skyscrapers. So they set bombs and explosives everywhere and they raise it to the ground. It's like, what in the world does that mean? Literally, that word comes from the word razor as if you were to shave it and make it just clean like it was nothing there. And that's what God wants us to do with our roofs, our ceilings, our um, our caps. He wants us to erase that. He wants us to take it off so that we can see the stars and see greatness and dream again. Because sometimes when we dream, all we're dreaming of and seeing is the ceiling. Man, if I could just get married. <laughs> some, some of my young people, come on. If I could just get married. Oh my goodness. If I could just get through college. If I could just graduate. If I could just work at McDonald's. Listen, all those things may be a step. And those are goals and those are great. But do not let that be your ceiling. Man. Let's erase those things, man. Say, yeah, man, I want to get a job. It might be at McDonald's, but this ain't it. This is not my ceiling. This is not. I, I want to be this. I want, I want to get somebody saved. I want to get one person saved. But that's not your ceiling. It's not like a quota. Well, I did this, so I'm good. No, 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 no. God wants you to, wants us to erase that roof so that he can do great things exceedingly great things and listen where's that power at work at somewhere out in the cosmos somewhere somewhere way up in heaven no 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 that power is at work and according to Ephesians 3.20 in us the Bible says that angels longed to look into that mystery how we could be called the sons and daughters of God in the hands and feet of Christ in other words it's a huge deal like, it's amazing that God would use you and I, imperfect, mortal, where we have just, we have limitations. But man, we step over into God's realm and we let him use us. There are no limitations. God can do what he wants. Okay, so anyway, that's Ephesians 3.20. But there are certain things in our life that are governors. Anybody drive, uh, drive in here and, you know, if you go over a certain amount, that governor kicks in. Unless you've tweaked with it a little bit. I don't know where Josh is. He done went out the door. But unless you've tweaked it a little bit and there's no more governors, all right? So uh, y'all can tell him I'm talking about it when he comes back in. But yeah, I, used to, I had a friend. I have a friend, a great friend. And, you know, and he, he's a fireworks friend. Anyway, he borrowed a truck from another dude, one other, another one of my friends. And, and so uh, Tim Lynch was the guy. He borrowed his truck. <laughs> I won't mention his name. I love him. So anyway, uh, he came to Tim because Tim let him, you know, use it for some kind of job. And he said, Tim, something wrong with your truck, man. It's, 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 I don't know what it is, but when I hit 90, like, like something happens with the, with the engine. It just cuts off and it just, boom, just goes down. You need to go get it checked out. <laughs> Tim was telling me the story. He said, I ain't never let that dude drive my truck again. If you want to know who it is, you can ask me. I'm serious. I can't, I can't tell him I like this. I love it. But anyway, <laughs> that's so funny. And some of y'all ain't raised, you ain't saying nothing, but you already found out. What's a governor? Oh, I have no idea. What is it? Y'all, y'all, anyway, praise God. You hit that speed, and so and I'm not talking we need to go out there and, you know, speed. And but what I am saying is there are things in life that want, literally want to cap you. 
You hit 90, that's it. You can't handle no more. You can't handle the truth. No. You can't handle any more than that. That's it. 90s, that, that, that's all. And in our life, and again, I ain't saying we need to go 100 miles an hour down the freeway, all right? You go down and get pulled up. Whoop. Well, my pastor said we need to get the governor's off. No, no, no. Don't say that. All right? But what I am saying in life is that there are things that will govern you. You hit that step. You hit that flow, man. You going, man. You hit, whoa, hit 70. Whew. Man, I'm doing good. I'm reading my Bible. You know, I, I'm starting to save in that savings account. Man, I'm starting to build up some equity in my in my house. I'm starting to do, man, I'm still, our marriage is, you know, it's, kick, it's, it's kicking in another gear. You know, things are going good. And, and, you know, my children, I finally got them in church or, or whatever, man, whatever the, the thing may be. My business is really starting to get off the ground now. And I can actually pay myself instead of paying into the business and, and and we hit something, you know, we, we, we get off the ground a little bit, but then there's a governor or something that's like literally keeps us from going forward. There are different ones. It's not just one thing. It's many things. Sometimes it's other things that happen. Sometimes it's what's inside of us that govern us. Okay? But we should only let God govern us. There's rules and regulations that, you know, we need to adhere to, you know, like, hey, you know, don't jump off a cliff. You're going to die. You know, even the devil said, Jesus, jump off this cliff. And he said, I'm going to tempt God. That's not even the will of God, man. He says, and the devil used scripture and said, well, if you, if you, the, the Bible says that angels will have charge over you and they won't let your foot strike the ground. And Jesus just, man, please. You know, he just literally said that to the devil. Come on. He smacked his feet. He said, man, please. That he said, do not tempt the Lord your God. That's foolishness is what he was saying. But there are, there's, there are rules and regulations that we need to adhere to. You know, uh, it's like, you know, we abstain from sex until marriage. Well, why do I need to? Those are, there are things and guidelines that God gives us in the Bible. And so as we obey that, then it takes the responsibility off of us. And literally, we start to walk in his power. Amen. And the roof is raised, R-A-Z-E, off of our life. Raised off of our life. What are some, what are some governors in our life? Y'all, I, I, I ain't ready for this first one. I don't know if y'all are ready for this first one. But whenever I was, you know, praying and, and talking to God about that, he hit this and he hit me right down in the fields, like right down in the gut. It was like a gut punch. Anybody ever got sucker punched in the gut? Anybody ever? Come on, two people. All right, man. That's a, and you don't have no wind. You didn't, hit, you didn't have no, you know, you weren't ready. You know, if you're ready, you could take it, man. Take it like a champ. But if you ain't ready, you're like, oh, uh -huh. you make, you know, some kind of crazy. <laughs> Y'all ain't never been there. Okay. On the football field, you weren't ready for that blind side gauge. <clears throat> and you weren't ready for that blind side. You run, I'm going to get this, but bam. That just, it's a sucker punch. Well, I felt like I was sucker punched with this one, but then God started to explain some things. The first governor in our life that literally we hit that stride and we're going and we're going and things are getting good and we're starting to soar. The Bible says we crawl and then we walk, then we run, then we start to soar. We think we're, you know, uh, Michael Jordan, you know, soaring through. Everything's good and all of a sudden, bam, governor, back on the ground. The first thing that God said is a governor that just keeps our feet on the ground and keep my feet on the ground as far as in a bad way, not letting me soar, is comfort zones. Ooh. I said, God, I wouldn't run. <laughs> why why'd you have to go there, man? Because I got some comfort zones. And, you know, when we say that, oh, all that sounds preachy and great, but I want us to reflect it onto your life. What comfort zones do we have? Like, I, uh, we all have a bunch of comfort zones. Let me, let me describe this. Comfort zones in our life. Only, here, here's, one, here's, here's one phrase. There's a few of them. And this is, I asked Paul, I said, what is a comfort zone? What, in your own definition, what, what, what is a comfort zone? And he said, only doing what you can do. Come on. I said, okay, you know, that's deep, that's heavy. All right, walk heavy now, high stepper. Only doing what you can't do. Be settled with that. You know, if you only do what you can do, you'll never aspire to great things because you'll never do more. You'll only settle. And so comfort zones and settling go hand in hand. Another thing, an analogy of comfort zone, Chris, or you, there you are, my, my nephew Chris is an amazing baseball player. I mean, just awesome, a slugger and a pitcher and all kind of stuff. But a comfort zone will be if I just stay on home plate, I'll never get out. 
You know, I don't have, if I just stay and it's a false uh, thought because, you know, eventually you will be kicked out of the game. You will be thrown out. But if I don't, if I don't try to take my foot off of this space on first base, maybe you're at first base and, and, and go to second base, you know, that's good. But, you know, eventually there's a runner that comes behind you and you got to go. If you're in first or second, you might like, ah, I don't want to run this time. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm comfort zone. But there'll be a time. It's like, it's, it's either I run or I get out, period. And that is a comfort zone that we think in our lives that we can, we can settle in, in, in as long as it feels good. Now listen, I want to say this, and I ain't ready. This is a sucker punch to me again, y'all. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there, what I felt God said to me. But, uh, okay, I'm going to read. I don't want to get this mixed up, but... God does not want to give you a life of ease. Somebody say, ooh. God does not want to give you a life of ease, but a life of effectiveness. God does not want to give us a life of ease, but a life of effectiveness. I'm going to say that one more time. I'm preaching to myself, y'all. God, God does not want to give you a life of ease, but a life of effectiveness. Now, let me... Let me go backtrack for a second. What about God's grace? What about his fulfillment, his peace? Well, let me say this. Those things only come when we step out in faith. <laughs> we think that those come when we stay on home plate, yo. But, we're, but we are putting our faith in ourself and our comfort zone and our home plate. As long as I don't do that, I'm good. As long as I don't step out that way, I'm good. But it should be as long as I stay with God, no matter what, I'm good. Amen. And if he calls me to run to second base or run to the outfield and do five laps of Jericho Marks 12, 15, 165 times, then I'm good because my God. My grace, my fulfillment, my joy, my peace, my strength, my protection does not come from me staying back in my comfort zone. It comes from me hooking myself up to Jesus Christ and saying, I will go with you to the ends of the earth. Amen. That is what God had. Then fulfillment comes. When you get out of your comfort zone, you rely on God for balance and not routine. Okay. So we, we got a routine. Everything's cool. Everything's good. You know, I wake up, got my nine to five. I got my business. And, you know, I got this. And, and, you know, and I do this. But I don't do that because it's not really me. And, and I don't feel comfortable doing that. But I can do this. And, you know, I don't really feel comfortable inviting my coworkers to church. And, you know, my, my, you know, my other students in my class or, you know, my neighbor or, you know, but as long as I do this, I'm good. As long as I go to church, I'm cool. You know, my comfort zone. We all have different ones, man. You know, and just because yours is not somebody else's, listen, we all have them. Everybody. But God's saying that's limiting you. That's limiting me in you. Because I'm the, God says I'm the limitless one. I'm in you. But you need to unleash me, okay? You need to unleash me in you. And with your spirit, just follow me. But God says our comfort zones literally govern us. That's our roof. That's our ceiling. And as long as we're good with that, you know, we might have a semi-good life and everything, but we will never go to the next level. And our children will follow suit because we laid the path for our children's future. Um, Johnny McGowan said this. He just wrote a book, man. He's a great man of God. Um, he said... He's Pastor Joel Osteen's right-hand man, Johnny McGowan. We've known him for a long time. Helped raise up his kids are great. Jonathan McGowan, Elizabeth McGowan. But Johnny McGowan said this, we want literally our children to stop, start where we stopped off. Like we want our ceilings to be their um, foundations. But if we keep our ceilings right here, then that literally will, will set our children back. And see, it's a generational thing. Because when we say, all right, we're not going to have a poverty mindset in this household. We're not going to, we, we know, we're not going to just accept whatever the devil throws at us. We're going to overcome that thing. Speak the word to that thing. We're going to say we are the blessed of the Lord. We are anointed for, to be minister of the gospel. 
We'll lay hands on the sick. We're going to have a spirit of peace in this house. Uh, Y'all are going to be champions. I'm going to raise up some champion children. We have that, then it takes the ceilings off of our kids. Because he's called us to raise the roof in our households. Listen, man, you, you, parents, you control the climate of your home. I don't know how else to say that, but if you're letting somebody else control it, they may be controlling it, but it's your fault. Ooh, it's my fault. Come on, somebody. It's our fault as parents. If we let that child or somebody else or an aunt or an uncle or a friend or a teacher or a coach or, you know, whatever comes in, control the atmosphere. There's not an atmosphere of faith and peace. Listen, things always come. And I'm not. Listen, we all deal with those things. But I'm telling you, we have the authority to change that temperature and say, no, nope, not in this house. Amen. I'm going to keep on speaking the word. I'm going to keep on loving. And we all will mess up. And there will be times that everybody fails. I'm not speaking down to anybody because I'm in the same boat. But listen, we are called to control the spiritual Amen. atmosphere in our house. Right. Oh, yeah, we're going to read the Bible this morning or tonight. We're going to go to church this morning. Or we're going to do this. And you control that. And man, people might not like it, but I'm telling you, they're, I, we were youth pastors for 22 years. It wasn't something like that. And I love teenagers. And so many times people think, well, you can't, man, you can't expect that much out of them. Come on. Man. You know what I'm saying? They're just teenagers. But they were ready to be called something else besides just teenagers. They were ready for somebody to say, no, 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 no. These ain't just teenagers. These are champions. These are our future. These are our, our next leaders. These are everything that God's going to do in the next 20, 30 years. These are it because they are next in line and they're champions. And they're ready to hear that. And they might still be doing the wrong thing, smoking dope, you know, rebelling, doing everything. But that's all right. Just because they're in a mess and doing something wrong does not stop me from calling greatness out of Amen. them. You're called to be great. That's not even like you to do that. Come on. Uh, you, you know, I expect so much more because you have so much more inside of you. You are great. You're anointed. You're powerful. You're God's man. You speak and you're changing that atmosphere. You're changing that. You are changing that atmosphere in your house. And young people, listen, you can't, we can't blame if our parents didn't or that. Listen, you are responsible ultimately in the specter of your life and destiny. You are responsible for the spiritual atmosphere in your life and the roofs that you set. We are all responsible. And that's the first thing. If we want to take these roofs off, we got to take some responsibility. I said, oh, this roof was put on by my grandparents. This, you know, I was just, now I've always been limited financially. I've always been limited spiritually. Nobody's ever had real big gifts in our family. You know, no, 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 no. Listen, you can take the roofs off. Right. Don't put the blame on somebody else because, listen, they may not ever come to your rescue. But God has already done, been there, already came to our rescue, and he's there waiting for us. His grace, his love, his mercy. Remember again, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But that, what, what does that scripture mean? What does that mean? It means that your past doesn't need to govern your future. Amen. Just because you messed up. It said, it's all good. Jesus can forgive you. Let's just get up and go forward. Amen. There's therefore now no condemnation. And so listen, the ceilings... And the regulations and the governors that we're talking about in us, me included, this morning. There's no condemnation. We all have them. But I want to say, let's go for it. Let's raise them off the roof. Somebody say amen. So the first governor is comfort zones. Again, when you get out of your comfort zone, you rely on God and for balance and energy and power and not on routine. Again, God does not want to give you a life of ease, but a life of effectiveness. When he makes you effective, he gives you grace and fulfillment. Ever always remind, I want to say this. God does want to make things enjoyable. Y'all understand that? He wants to make your life a life of joy, of peace, and of fulfillment. But that does not equal to a life of ease. Is that y'all understand what I'm saying? When somebody lit, wins the gold medal, med, med, medal in the Olympics, they have joy, they have peace, they have they celebrate. I'm, I'm taking this to a, a natural, you know, thing and everything. But was it easy? 
No. <laughs> All right? Unless you were Michael Phelps or something. No, even from him. He had a lifetime of training. All right? And God wants us to be like that. He might look like he is winning with ease, and he might literally win with ease. But it's because that he has struggled and strained and equipped himself and literally his whole life. David, when he fought Goliath, it looked like, whoosh, whoosh, that's it. That was easy. God enabled him, and he had the power to effectively have faith and do what he was called to do. But everything that he went through to get to that point, he had to press, and it was not easy to tell his brothers when his brothers were looking down. And who'd you leave those few sheep with, you little runt boy? What are you doing, man? You just a brat. You want to come out here and look? You're not even taking care of your own. Where you, have you done your chores yet? I mean, he had to press through that. That wasn't easy, but it was necessary. So God just wasn't like one to, oh no, oh Eliab, you know, I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to shut his mouth today. And, you know, I'm going to make sure that this happens. And I'm going to make sure that that happens. So everything's just easy. Just walk there. Everything's great. No, no, no. He's wanting to change us right. and strengthen us so that we can speak to those things and we can be effective. And while we're winning, we will have joy and peace and fulfillment and we will do it in his strength. Right. So it's doable. But I'm telling you, he wants you to become effective. And that blows my mind because a lot of times I'm scared of doing the thing that he wants me to be effective at. That scares me. That's a, that's a good thing. When we look forward and say, I'm, I want to do that. Next step. I think I can do that. Next step. I'm going to do that. Next step. I start to try to do that. So at least our minds are open to that scares me, but I'm, I'm going to take a shot. You know, I can see myself taking a shot. I, 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 you know, I think I, I think I can do that thing. I, I'm going to open, allow myself to dream that direction so that I can at least start moving that way. And we're getting ready and getting prepared to take those roofs and ceilings off in our life. Man. All right. The next thing, and let's go hand in hand. What governs? Let me say this. What what's what puts parameters around our comfort zones? What creates our comfort zones? Fears. Fear, four-letter word, and y'all listen, that is a cuss word. That is a four-letter word, fear, because it'll destroy your life more than any other four-letter word in, in the English language. It will destroy our lives. It will literally set parameters. If we let fear dominate our life, it will drive us to the wrong way. It will play literally a chess. Don't ever play a chess match with fear. And so this circumstance happens like, oh, man, I can't go there. And this happens. And oh, and who and who's playing our fears, Satan? And, you know, he uses other people and all that. But, and, and, you know, they're called fiery arts, whatever you want to say. And, and he moves this chess piece in a circumstance. Happens. Your parents do that. And, oh, man, I, so I need to go this way. And, and well, nobody's serving God in my school. So, oh, man, I can't just make waves. And I, can't, I can't stand up against everybody else. And, 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 and then somebody says this. And, they, and, they do, and so we, we kind of go in. And somebody labels us. You know, we're not good enough. So we kind of just go back here. And eventually, if we play chess match with fear... We will be backed into a corner and Satan will call checkmate and he will have us completely immobilized. But when we call the shots, when we raise our A-Z-E, the roof off of our life, then we don't react. We say, no, no, I'm going to take the first move and I'm going to let you react. So I'm going to go tell, I'm going to go share the gospel with my neighbor. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 say like, wait, say like, wait, 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 no, 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 you're scared of that, remember, remember, they're going to look at you like you're a freak, they're going to look at you, you know, the homeowner association probably going to call, they don't want you ringing their door, they don't want you inviting you to church, there's probably some law somewhere that you can't invite somebody to church, I don't know, and there's all these things just going through our mind, but you know what, we step out, and we say, I'm going to be on the offense, I'm going to take the first move and let the, let the devil move back, right. oh, devil, move out the way, move out the way, anyway, y'all, move, devil, anyway, I like that, I don't want to be on the defense, I don't want to react to something life's throwing at me, yeah, yeah, that's, there's things that are going to happen in our life that we have no control over, like other people, how can we think we got control of the, uh, other people when God himself doesn't even control other people, he gives them their own free will, right, <laughs> 
Now, again, with our family, we can set rules and regulations and we can set the standard of our household. But eventually they're going to make up their own mind and they're going to grow up and they're going to leave. But I'm telling you, we can we can. The Bible says raise up a child, train up a child in the way they should go when they're young. And when they grow up, they shall not depart. And we stand on that scripture. But I want you to know that you cannot control the mind of somebody else. But man, we are going to be on the offense. We are not going to cower out and move every time something happens or a law is passed that's contrary to the will of God or, or somebody says something that's like, you shouldn't even do that. Who do you think you are? You're narrow minded, believe in the Bible. It's like, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry. I should, you know, no, no, you stand your ground. That's right. Let them come with all their chest pieces and say, you know what? I still, God is God. And you stand your ground and then you start, yeah, I'm going to tithe. Oh, you stupid, you crazy, you going to get 10% of you ignorant, you lost your mind. Well, I just believe the Bible's true and I'm just going to do what it, what it says. Amen. So I'm just going to step forward. And then all of this, listen, sometimes we're like, man, I don't know, it's a step of faith and I don't see nothing. I don't see but Peter, I don't see nothing but water, raging wind, everything. But the Bible says, dude, I'm just going to do it. I'm stepping out of faith and God will meet your faith. And you will take off that limitation. You will take those limitations, those financial limitations. You can't give people, you can't help people out. You can't buy somebody a car. You can't help steer, your kids can't go to college. You can't do this, you can't do that. And listen, that is fiery darts from the devil. You say, oh yeah, watch me. I'm going to start, you You start, well, I'm going to tithe. I'm actually going to be a giver. I'm going to help somebody that I don't even know. I'm going to give them a hundred bucks. I'm going to just be kind. I'm going to start sowing. I'm going to start doing things. I'm going to start helping out. And literally, you're on the offense. Amen. And you're not governed by your fears. And you step out. So the first, the first governor that would try to keep us, our ceiling, is the comfort zone. The second one is fears. And the third one is unbelief. <laughs> we all have that, man. Listen, uh, everybody has this in life. But it is a ceiling. And... You know, there's there's acceptable sins. Come on, y'all, can y'all go there with me real quick? In the in the Christian culture, come on, y'all, don't don't stare at me like I'm crazy now, like a cow at a new gate, y'all. In the Christian culture, and I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm just I'm talking about the Christian culture. There's acceptable sins. Like, yeah, you know, you don't want to go murder nobody now. You know, that's that's you know that's black and white. You could see that the murder is wrong. You know, and you probably, you know, probably don't want to, you know, do any cocaine or heroin or anything. That's probably pretty bad. You might die. You know, you don't want to do that. But, you know what I'm saying, just a little of this. Just, you know, that. And, you know, we can do a little gossiping. You know, that's cool. You know, we, you know, we're in the church. We can do a little gossiping. We can just, we can eat whatever we want. Think we're going to live forever. You know, we can do that. It's acceptable, you know. Unbelief is one of those things. That it's accepted. It's like, oh, that's cool. It's a Christian sin. It's, you know, you know, oh, man, don't smoke that. Don't do that. And I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm just saying that in, in the scope of things, we see different things as acceptable. And we're like, um, you know, unbelief is literally something that will limit us and crush us. Right. Matter of fact, it won't just be a ceiling. That ceiling will drop and crush our dreams to the ground. Bible says the children of Israel, man, they walked around and they said, man, we can't take this city. Joshua, what in the heck? What have you been smoking, man? What is in your pipe, yo? We can't take, look at those guys. They're 10 foot tall. Man, we look like a grasshopper, man. And, and they saw us. We look like a grasshopper to them. And, and as a matter of fact, I feel like a grasshopper. I ain't got nothing on them. And here you are, think that we can just, with a bunch of ragtag slaves, walk around this place and think we're all that and go and take this city. Who do you think you are? Limitation, limitation, limitation. Ceiling, limitation. And God said there was a spirit of unbelief. And he didn't just say it was a spirit of unbelief. This is the words of God. Our father said it was a wicked spirit of unbelief. In other words, and it was like God looked at it and it's like, that is something that will crush their soul. When we just don't believe, I can't do that. Again, we believe that God can do things outside, you know, over there or, you know, around the world or in some other country or, you know, in some other family. If they're born into something or, you know, they got a little some, some little, little money that they can do that. But but with me, that's a whole nother ball game. And God says that's a spirit of unbelief, man. And it's wicked. In other words, God was saying it will crush your soul. 
It will take you out. But the thing is, is the devil's sneaky, man. He's like, oh, yeah, you ain't going to go kill nobody, probably, you know. But you, 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 <laughs> probably, unless you, anyway, so we might, we might be dealing with different things. You don't know who's dealing with what, okay, anyway. Don't look to your right or to the left. Well, we all have different things, but the devil says, but, but I can see them accepting this one. You know, they, they ain't going to murder somebody. They might have been delivered from cocaine or heroin. And, you know, that might not be a temptation for them, but I'm going to throw a little unbelief in there. You're not good enough to do that. Man, what? Are you stupid? Hey, are you crazy? You, I mean, that didn't make sense. How are you going to get the money? Huh? Tell me. Now, how? Anybody ever thought that? I'm just, you know, sometimes I speak to myself. And I, how are you, how you going to get the money? What happened last time? Oh, man, I just hit something. I mean, what happened last? Do you remember last time you tried that? You know, who do you think you are now? You all that in a bag of chips. You think you can accomplish something? Those are fiery darts. Unbelief that's being sowed. And that's not who we are. And that's not what we have inside. But there are thoughts that come to our mind. I'm not good. I can't. And God says, man, don't give in to that spirit of unbelief. It is a limiter. It is a governor that will crush you. And listen, that ceiling won't always stay there. We say, oh, that's our ceiling. Oh, I'll do that. You know, and that's as much. But eventually that ceiling will crush you. Anybody ever watch the Temple of Doom? Hold up, man. Y'all are too holy, man. Y'all ain't never watched no TV. Yeah. You ever watch that? You know what I'm saying? And, and Indiana Jones was in there and all those bugs everywhere. And, you know, you got the, the spikes coming down and he's hitting the little secret doorknob thing. And then he gets into this one thing before he goes on and the walls start to... He's like, oh my gosh. And then finally he gets that little knob and breaks it out. And he's like, you know, whatever struts out. That's what happens in our life. We get in, we think all oh, the things great. You know, and I'm not ever going to do anything great, great, but, you know, that's who I am. I'll stay in this, you know. Everything's cool. You know, I'm good enough. I'm in my comfort zone, my ease zone. And uh, I can see my ceiling. I know, I know what my limitations are. I can see that. So everything's good. I'm cool. Well, life doesn't just pause and, pfft, oh, everything's good. Those walls will cave in because they're false hopes. Those walls will come down, and you'll find yourself like Indiana Jones, like, oh, my, what in the heck? What that spike? And everything's like, <laughs> Anybody ever been there? Don't raise your hand. We don't blow your cover. But how many of us have been there? We thought everything was good. And then those walls start to come down. That ceiling. And it's literally our ceilings and our walls. Satan's plan is for them to crush us. God's plan is for them to be expanded and taken off. Satan's plan is for our ceilings to crush us. And it's always, oh yeah, it's staying there. It's always been there. But you know, he's sneaking. And eventually, he's going to try to crush you with it. Crush us with it. But I'm saying you don't accept those things. Unbelief is something that is socially and in Christianity, you know, our culture acceptable. A sin. But it is, when I say sin and wicked, it means, it, I'm just saying that it is something that will separate you from God. And will literally crush your soul to where you're like, I can't do anything. I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough father. I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not a good enough man. I'm not a good enough employee. I'm not a good enough uh, business owner. I just can't, can't, can't. And so eventually those walls will crush you. That ceiling will crush you. But those ceilings and walls may be on your life. But if you just believe to dream a little bit, I can. Eventually they will expand and that roof will be taken off of your life. But do not accept unbelief. Unbelief is simply, listen, it takes faith. You, you got to have faith for unbelief. You just have the faith in the wrong thing. That's right. Unbelief is simply believing only in what you can see. Come on. I ain't never seen that done. So, you know, it can't be done. I, 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 well, show me. Just, just show me. Just prove it. Prove it. That's how. That's unbelief. Nobody, the Thomas Edison, whenever he would accept it, I ain't never seen that done. Well, then we wouldn't have light today. We'd have no light bulbs. But he said, yeah, just because you think it can't be done, just because nobody's ever done it before does not mean that it's undoable. And that's just in the natural. And in the spirit too. But I'm talking to both of your, your natural life and your supernatural life, the God, your spiritual life. Listen, God is saying, don't say I can't do it just because everybody else has not been able to do it. Man, believe, dream, dream again. 
There was a time in our life where I felt that I was so busy doing everything. When I say everything, I mean everything. We had this and that and the other. Life looked great to everybody else. You know, you have your Facebook life, okay? Come on, somebody. You have your Instagram life. And then you got real life, okay? Come on. But everything looked groovy in the Facebook. But I'm telling you, inside, there was no more dream left. There were ceilings everywhere, walls everywhere. And I was just like, literally had to get to a point where I say, God, you're either God, you've called me, and you've put these things or not. And I just allowed myself to start dreaming. That's what the prodigal son did. He said, man, he tried everything and all this stuff, and he was used up, and his friends, so-called friends, used all his stuff. Man, they smoked everything up. There was nothing left to smoke, nothing left to drink, no money left, no bills. No, there was nothing left for anything. And so everybody left him because they weren't really his day ones and his friends anyway, and they left him. And he was in the pig pens eating leftover pig slop, which is pretty bad. Pig slop is bad enough, but it was leftover pig slop. And literally, he woke up and he said, man, this is, this isn't me. This isn't what I was, I, my father has servants that are even better than this. This is not who I am. And he literally woke up and dreamed. What did he say in his mind to himself? He says, I will get up out of this slop and I will go to my father's house and I know at least I can, he'll accept me and I can do something, but this isn't who I am. He didn't have the road. He, was, he didn't even have a clear picture. But he, was, he didn't even, I mean, he, that was a, we think, oh man, what a lack of faith. He doesn't know that his father loved him and he was going to put the ring on his finger. What does he think? No, that's, but listen, at least he, he dreamed. Right. How did he get up out of the slop? Listen, in our lives, we're like, man, I don't have enough money to do that. And I can't do this. And man, I'm not able to do this. And I've never seen anybody really do that. What's in my heart? But, but how he didn't just all of a sudden everything perfect. He just got up. Because he dreamed. I'm better than this. This isn't my ceiling. This is who, like, who God created me to be. This is not who I am. And I know my father. And I know there's at least enough good in him and, and, and that he will love me enough to at least take me back in and let me stay on the farm somewhere. And it says that roof was raised off of his life. And he went back. He wasn't all there yet. Listen, he wasn't all. He was still thinking. He was still had a small mentality, but at least he started moving forward. And it said he arose out of the slop. I mean, that's the lame translation. He got up and went back home and of course y'all know the story the father you know he was looking far off he ran to him he put his ring on his finger got the robe slotted the fatted calf put some ribs on the grill y'all come on somebody he said come on we're about to throw down tonight because my son whom I had lost and was dead in my mind is now alive he's dreaming and in our lives some of us have given up That slop just become routine. That's who I am. I deserve this, man. I went and squandered my whole everything. Or, you know, I, I've done my best and, and you know, I, I just, I've hit a wall and I, I can't do anymore. This is, it's got to be all I am because this is all I've, I've been able to do. God says, no, there's more. And you feel it. Down inside while I'm talking, all of us are see, we, we feel there's more to this life. I can do greater things. It's being stirred up inside of us. How do I get there? Dream. Amen. Dream. Yeah, and then we got to take action, but it starts with just dreaming. The prodigal son said, this is not me. I can do better than, I'm a child. My father's over there. He's great. He's a great and loving man. I know that. I don't know how. I don't even know the outcome. And every, but I'm just going to get up. God is calling us to do that, and to, that's the first step of blowing those things off, blowing that ceiling off, because we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength, but don't let unbelief keep us in the pig pen. How do we raise the governors off our, uh, to the ground? Let me say, let me say this, uh, number one, put your faith in what you can't see. Put your faith in what you can't see. The three governors, again, comfort zones. Two is fear. Three is unbelief. But how do we raise that? Number one, well, what I just said, put your faith in what you cannot see. 
Well, I ain't never done that before. Okay, that's great. That's an opportunity to put your faith to work. You know, the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. So if you can believe, all things are possible to those that believe. Now faith, the Bible says, now faith, in Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of what? Things not seen. So if you ain't never seen it done, if you have never done it in your life and people put labels on you, you can't do that, that's all good. You're a candidate. You, God says, man, just work your faith. Start to dream again. Start to dream like you were a kid. Man, one day I'm going to be an astronaut. Man, one day I'm going to be a firefighter. One day I'm going to be a preacher. I'll, you know, I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going you know, to be, be a billionaire. You know, all those big dreams. And we say, oh, that's just childish, man. That's, just, yeah, that's cute. That's cute. Somebody listen to your dream. Oh, that's cute. That's cute, Freddie. That's cute. Yeah, you want to do that? That's cute. Anybody ever been brushed off like that? You feel it? Like, mm. Bible said don't, don't cast your pearls to the swine. In other words, you, you don't have to tell everybody all your dreams. But there are certain people you do need to because they'll call more out of you. Say, that's great. That's a start. But you know what? You can even do more than that. And you're like, wait a minute. That was blowing my wig off at first. But now you really blew my wig off like even more. You want those kind of people in your life. Man, I want to own a business one day. You know, I want to do that. Oh, that's great, man. Why don't you own a franchise, man? You can say, whoa. Well, I mean, you're like, what the heck, man? Hold up, man. I'll... You need those kind of people that will blow that off of your life and not say, what? Well, you know, you know, don't dream. Too... You don't want to get your hopes up too much. No, listen, let's get our hopes up. That's what the prodigal son did in the pig pen. He got his hopes up and then he got his life back and then he become great. He became the heir that his father was believing God for. I mean, the, the father, which in that example of that, was God the father. But he became the, the heir and a son that he wanted. He, he walked in that role. Yeah. Number two, how to, take the, how to raise the roofs off of your life is you've got to speak to the storm. Amen. Yeah. Now listen, I want to give you an example. Uh, because so many times, listen, Jesus loves to speak to the storm, and he did speak to the storm. Yeah. And he walked up. And he spoke to the storm in the disciples' life, said, peace, be still. And it was still. And they're like, dog, man, this guy is like really the Messiah. And you know what Jesus did? He was like, oh, yeah, that's all. He said, really, Peter? Seriously? He said, man, you have little faith. How long am I going to have to put up with this little faith, guys? Let me ask you this question. I asked this to Lisa. I was asking it to myself yesterday. Was it God's will? For Jesus to have to speak to the storm. Was that his plan? Was that his first go-to thing? Because if it was, then he probably wouldn't have told the disciples, you of little faith. Why did he tell the disciples, you of little faith? Man, how, much, how long are we going to have to put up with this? I'm ready for y'all to step it up. His plan was for them to speak to the storm right. or to believe, hey, we're going to make this, y'all. Jesus said that we're going to meet on the other side. He gave us that word, and so we're going to speak to the storm. Even if the storm doesn't stop, I'm going to keep going and believe because God's word is, is, is right anyway. We're going to keep on going. This thing, that was God so many times in our life, like, God, make it stop, make it stop. Ah! Nobody's ever been like that. Maybe it's just me, okay? And listen, maybe Jesus said, no, no, I'm inside of you, my power. You make it stop because the limitless one is inside of you. All right. All right. Another example, because I know some of y'all look at me like I'm, I'm crazy. Okay. Another example. Jesus just came off the Mount of Transfiguration. Boom, everything was happening. It was amazing. Uh, the mount, talk about a mountaintop experience. Peter, James, and John were with him. It was like, oh, my God, you know, and God said, you're the son of God. It was just amazing. Everything happened. And they come down and the rest of the disciples... We're trying to pray for this dude. He had like, you know, the devil was, the demons were on him, making him have epileptic seizures, throwing himself in the fire. That's what the Bible says. And the father comes and they bow down to Jesus and say, Jesus, man, can you do anything for my son? He's like, demon possessed, he's throwing himself in the fire. You know, and I thought, man, your disciples could do something, but they can't do nothing, man. I don't know what's, I don't know what to do. I'm like at my, 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 the, my wit's end, the end of my rope. Anybody ever been at the end of their rope? He said, Jesus. Can you do anything? And Jesus turned it. He flipped the script on him. Y'all know about that? He flipped the script. Somebody say flip the script. He said, can you believe? And the father was like, uh, whatever it takes, God, yes. 
He probably didn't even understand the question that much, but he just wanted his son to be healed. He's like, whatever it takes, yeah, I just, I'll do it, anything, God, just, what, yes. Amen. But God can use that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't have to be smart and have everything figured out. He just needs a willing heart like we That's figured right. out last week. And he said yes. And so Jesus said, man, well, hey, he called that demon out. He, he, he said that young man was literally healed from that moment on, never had another seizure, never threw himself in the fire or the water. Literally, the devil's plan was to kill him, and that's his plan for us. Right. And Jesus turns around, and he says this again to <laughs> the disciples. And they had cast out demons. They had got people healed. They had preached the gospel before, and then a couple chapters before. And it worked, but it didn't work in this situation. And Jesus said, sometimes, man, you got things ain't going to happen unless you pray and fast. In other words, you've got to get in and get some skin in the game, get your mind right, and get your flesh in check. In other words, you've got to, you've got to press in and believe God for certain things to happen. And pray and fast is a spiritual principle. You reap and you sow. You sow in time and energy and things, and you reap out God's power. Amen. Whenever you fast, that's a whole other thing. But what did Jesus say after that? He's not like, man, I'm glad you asked me. I'm so glad you asked me to, to heal him. I, I'm so glad that you recognize the power that's in me. That's not what Jesus said. Yeah, yeah. He said, man, you have little faith. How long am I going to have to put up with this, y'all? Yeah. What was he saying? You have power. Yeah. Use it. Yeah, right. Use it. And in our life, if we want to erase those ceilings in our life, man, we've got to speak to the storm. Flip the script and say, you know what? Everything's supposed to go this way in my life, but I'm not going to be satisfied. I'm not going to be comfortable. I'm not going to be cool with that because I know that God has greatness for my life. And I'm going to start to speak to the storm. And even if I don't see things changing, I'm still going to go forward because I have God's word and his promise inside of me. And I'm going to go forward in Christ. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. I know I'm running out of time here. But you speak. I want to say that. Number one, put your faith in God. How do you take the, the ceilings off your life? Number two, speak to the storm. Flip the script and declare, declare war on normal. Number three, take off your labels. No matter who's labeled you, you take those labels off and you wear God's label. Amen. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I am... Listen, I have the spirit of God inside of me. Just like it says in Ephesians 3.20, I have his power at work in me. And you declare that, you'll take those ceilings because you'll start seeing yourself as God sees you. That's right. Man. You might not may be able to snap your fingers and make everything change in your life. But if you start seeing yourself as God sees you, then literally it will start. It will put you in an atmosphere to br a, a, a breeding ground for greatness. That's right. For things to come out of you and gifts to come out of you and be stirred in you and planted in you. So eventually God will be able to do great things and take those and go way beyond those ceilings. Amen. But it starts with you speaking to the storm and believing that you're God who God created you to be. And number four is get hooked to the source. The source is God. The Holy Spirit is the source in our life. And we're going we're gonna to end with this. I'm going to say this, but I want you all to be ready. The source of God. There's so many times where our source is not God. Our source may be, you know, golf. It might be, well, I, you know, I got 10,000 in my account, man. I can, I can kick back and have some joy now. You know, I'm good. No, those things may be good, but that's not our source. Because there's a limited resource. If you go to a limited resource, something that's a resource is something that can, again, give you, you know, I need to, I need to go get more money. Well, there, my resource may be my, my bank account. My resource may be daddy. You know what I'm saying? A mama. Or, you know, my resource might be, well, I'm going to go play golf and kind of get rejuvenated. And those might be good things, but that is not the source because they are limited. God is your only limitless resource that can always resource you and fully charge you and level you up, young kids, and give you what you need to do to, to do what he has called, what he has called you to do. God is the only limitless resource and everything else is limited, even your spouse. Even church. Church is amazing. We should all go to church. But that's still limited. If that's your source, man... You're bound for failure. God is the only limitless resource. 
And yes, we need to go to church and we need to get the word in us and that helps rejuvenate us. But we got the reason why we have church is so I can take your hand and say, you know what? Let me take you to the source. Boom. Okay, I'll see you, you know, tomorrow. I'll see you next week. I'll be there. But as long as you're plugged up to the source, we're good. Because that is what will get you. Thank you, Levi. That's awesome. That's what church is about, is plugging you into the source. Not, oh, come get you. You know, you just come here. We got everything you need. No, no, no. We ain't got everything you need. We ain't got nothing you need. God has everything you need. We're just a house that we come and worship together. And God is here. And then God goes back with you in your life. And he is the source. God is the source. God is the source and his Holy Spirit inside of us, man. Listen, when we go and we pray and we worship and we pray in tongues and we love God and we, we, we cry or we sometimes you worship and you just shut your mouth, shut your eyes, shut everything out and just be still and know that he is God and he's good. That is worship. And that's when you're tapping into the source. Yeah. Tapping in to the source. I want to say this, and then we're going to close. Pastor Lisa, come up here real quick. Paul, you want to get up on the guitar real quick? I want to challenge you, man, no matter where you're at. Maybe the prodigal son. Listen, sometimes we tag the prodigal son as some bad dude. That's so, look, no, listen, we've all been there. Some of, We've all been there. But he tapped into the source by just dreaming. And it, I, I think maybe, maybe, maybe it's possible. That, that my father has a spot for me, you know, in his barn. I just, there's a possibility. What was he doing? He was dreaming, Mike. He was dreaming, brother Mike. He was dreaming. I'm telling you, man, let that dream start to revive inside of you. It might not start with some earth-shaking dream, but, you know, I'm going to be the next Billy Graham. Well, hey, maybe so. That's great. But you can't even think to tomorrow in a certain area of your life. And we all have that certain area. Maybe it's finances, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's marriage, maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's uh, love, maybe it's at work, maybe it's starting a company, and you're just like, I'm trying, I'm trying to try. Start to dream and start to look at yourself as God has looked at you and take that roof off of your life. Plug yourself into the source by praying, reading the Bible, praying the Spirit, man, getting connected to God. You get connected to people around you, and that's good. You need to have that sharpen each other. But man, get connected. Young people, you get and you pray on your own. Don't wait till mom and daddy tell you. Because that's good, and they're training you. But, man, you get connected. You come and drop to your knees and say, God, and just annoy me as I go to my school today. God, I need you. God, I love you. you connect into that power source. Church, we're, we're here to connect people to the power source. Parents, we're there to connect our kids into the power source. Husbands, wives, we're there to help connect our, 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 our spouse to the power source. Because we are not their savior. We are not their God. We are not their source. We are a limited resource.